A little jewel among the many urban treasures in the city of Edina is the Edina Art Center. Located in a leafy city park and natural wetland area, the Art Center offers a variety of classes and events unrivaled in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. From its origin in a small country house, the Art Center has grown to include three painting studios, three pottery areas, two additional classrooms, and a completely equipped media services center. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Colin Nelson. Welcome to the author studio. Our guest is Hafed Buasita, and uh, we'll get to Hafed in just a minute, but I want to thank you for coming. Uh, I am on the Edina Art Center board and welcome you in that capacity. I encourage you to take a look at our beautiful facility. For instance, we have a, a wonderful gift shop where you can buy local. You can buy local at uh, some tremendous prices for original works of art. And then take a look around here. Right now we have a faculty show uh, in progress. And I'd encourage you that if you are having a good experience here at the Art Center, consider taking classes. You do not have to be an Edina resident. Uh, there are class offerings, or if you are interested, uh, stop at the front desk. There are some membership packets. Love to have you join. Uh, I also am an author myself. My most recent book is Fallout, which is a suspense novel set here in Minnesota. But we're going to talk about a different type of work today. Um, Hafed Buasida is our guest. He is a veteran screenwriter. He has worked in film literally all over the world. And he also teaches at Minneapolis Community and Technical College. He didn't know I was going to say this, but last year, out of 32 colleges in Minnesota, he was selected as Teacher of the Year, by the way. That's a curveball right there. <laughs> <laughs> some of you might be new. Today I, I see some new faces. If you'd like to be kept uh, in touch or keep in touch with us about uh, future programs, we meet here the second Saturday of every month at 10 o'clock. So for instance, next uh, February, or next month in February, uh, Beth Dooley, who writes a column, a food column for the Star Tribune, is going to be talking about her cookbook and maybe even cooking. So if you'd like, please uh, put your name and your email and uh, we can keep in touch with you about future programs. Thanks, Mary. And then finally, before we talk to Hafed, Hafed's book is for sale. It's called Screenwriting 001, a definitely less than 101 level textbook. And I particularly like the dedication in this book. <clears throat> To the greatest mind I have ever known, and I've learned everything from him, Colin Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hafez. Thank you. Thank you. You deserve it. Maybe, maybe that isn't in here. Well, we'll make it. Anyway, Hafed, um, one of the most interesting things, I think, uh, about not only about your screenwriting, your filmmaking, but is your, your background. For instance, Hafed Buasida is not a Scandinavian name, is it? It doesn't look like one. <laughs> no. Where are you from? And tell us about film school. I, I would like to hear about, where did you go to film school? Well, um, in the time I wanted, to, because I, you know, since I was young, I was crazy about movie making, obviously. And I, just like everybody else, I wanted to become a filmmaker, a movie maker. And movie making is obviously not as easy as people think that, yeah, you just go to film school and then everything is going to happen. Uh, the problem is which film school. And at the time, I wanted to go to film school, being uh, somewhere living between France and Tunisia, North Africa, meant to me that um, he, he, I wanted, like everyone else, to go to the best of the best. And the best of the best at the time was the Prague Film School, which was, uh, to this day, is one of the best film school in the world. And uh, I wanted to go there. Little did I know that it was so complicated and so difficult and 
uh, you have to learn a completely new language. Uh, I'm not too far from it because my mom happens to be half Czech, so it's as it were, so I had a connection uh, in the genes, as they say. Uh, so I, I, that was that, that, you know, so I decided, I said, well, yeah, f sure, I'll learn the language, what the heck, you know, I'm going to learn the language and I'm going to, because of the film school, because it's the best film school. So I went to Prague and uh, learned for one year the language and then um, I said, okay, I'm going to go to film school. Well, film school, there are about 350 people from all over the world who were competing for four spots. So, you know, uh, whatever, to make a long story short, finally, mm, up and down, I made it. And, uh, and uh, so that's how I started with Prague mm -hmm. uh, and to start to learn filmmaking. And filmmaking means you have to learn screenwriting, you have to learn producing, you have to learn, and all of those are specific uh, 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 specialties where you have to spend four years at least in each of those specialties if you want them really to get to get a degree in those specialties and uh, that's where kind of I, start, I started and I started at this very problematic time in the in the world which was the the 68 uh, obviously the time when there was the big revolution in Prague, there was this, uh, you remember Dubček and all mm -hmm. of these people that started kind of, and which, which was crushed completely a year after that. So as it were, I was part of that spring where the, everybody was in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the parks and talking and for the first time, you have after 30 years of communism, people would, were able to come out and talk, you know. That strikes me, Hafed, that you're going to a film school, but it's surrounded by a very repressive, yes. censored uh, environment, the Soviet Empire. How, how did that work? Well, it worked because uh, the idea, the, the particularities in many of those communist countries was that there is repression on one side, but they consider and they have an absolute respect and for the art. Not because they love the art, it's because they use the art in terms of propaganda. And so for them, artists, musicians, filmmakers, are people you should put on a pedestal, provided that they don't go beyond a certain line. <laughs> so you have to be extremely careful in what you say. Um, for those who want to know a little bit more, you know, you can even go online to this day and uh, after the revolution was crushed by Soviet Union, you know, came into Prague, literally I woke up one morning and there was a tank in front of my house. Wow. You know, it's literally like that. So, and the, the, the day before, the night before, I was in the movies at 10.30 and there was nothing. You know. So when you get to that point, uh, so for those who would like to know, you can see, for instance, a short story that I wrote and to this day is still there in the newspapers that were actually uh, uh, prohibited by the new government. And I got in trouble, obviously, uh, and uh, I was questioned and all of that stuff because they didn't like that me, someone at the film school, I was writing this short story which was very controversial and was printed in this particular newspapers which were against the government. So, uh, so I had my own kind of run on with the law. <laughs> However, being a, a foreigner was good because at the end of the day, you know, what can they say? You know, they can tell you to get out, you know, that's all they can do. Luckily, I kind of evaded the, those ways and means. So, so to go back to your question, um, the regime, as it were, benefits from the notoriety of the filmmakers, the musicians, whoever those people are. And that's how they, they, they get that, uh, as, a, as, as, as a state, that's how they get that notoriety. I mean, the same is happening with sports. You all remember how, how much money uh, Soviet Union was putting in those, or China the today, Olympics, or whatever, yeah. you know, because they use that as a, as a tool. That's how, 
it really uh, happened. Now, you know. when you were there, were you meeting in classrooms, or did you have to well, hide to some you know, degree? I actually uh, just uh, wrote about that uh, because you brought this issue of the 32 or 37 schools, uh, <laughs> universities and stuff. Because they did ask me, you know, before they, usually before they nominate you, so they have to nominate you. My school has to nominate me to the pool. And then they, they announce that, yes, we are going to nominate you, but there is some work to do, which means you have to write dissertations and how, to, how do you teach and what's your philosophy and all of that kind of annoying uh, uh, writing and which which I was not even close or remotely interested in and so my president was like you know hey we want you to be there I said I'm not interested I have no time for it and and then at the end I said well what would make it why not you make the time I said I'll make the time if I have some fun with it and he looked at me and said, what this idea of fun? I said, well, <laughs> well, I said, I will make it my own way. And uh, he said, well, what is your own way? And my own way, I said, well, I will do it the way I know how to best do it. I'm going to write a script about it. <laughs> You funny. are going to write a script about it. Uh, I should have brought that script, but that's OK, you know. Uh, and, and they said, but no, nobody did that. I mean, do you imagine sending a script to Mensky? I mean, you know, <laughs> to those people who have never seen a script. I said, that's how I know how to do things. I'm going to imagine a story. I'm going to write a script. And every scene of that script will <laughs> respond to one of your stupid questions. <laughs> and, you know, so basically I imagined I concocted that whole screenplay <laughs> as a response to their 20 page that they wanted, mm -hmm. you know. So I imagined it, I wrote it, and I presented it to my dean and my president, and which they swiftly refused. <laughs> and they said, you are nuts. You know, we are not going to do that. I said, that's all I have. If you want it, you know, take it. Or so they send it to them. You and they send it to them, and they call us the same day. And they say, it's great. We love it. <laughs> However, it has 30 pages. You need to shorten it 10 pages. How do I shorten 10 pages from a story that makes sense structurally and everything uh, in order to, I said, you know, if you count the numbers, the, the, the words, you're going to find out that I'm much less than about the 20,000 words that usually you actually uh, expect. And they said, we know, but it has to have 20 pages, no matter what. <laughs> uh, uh, which gets us, in a minute, to that difference between actually screenwriting and other kinds of writing. But at the end of the day, I sat down, I did it, I did what they wanted, I got it to 21 pages, and it went on, and the rest, as they say, is history, kind of. So that's kind of where, where you have to do things your own way. To go back to Prague, I had to do things my own way and to survive the way I can. And to make movies that were, uh, for instance, in, in Prague, there was obviously the mass of the people, mm -hmm. but there was this microcosm of but a different world, which is a very different world than the normal one. It's the world of the artist and where things happen and where people have the ability to exchange ideas and so on. And provided that those ideas don't go beyond the circle, then, then it's fine. But the danger is when those ideas go actually beyond the circle and then they become public and then it becomes a problem. So that's How many of you have had the experience that I've had where you read a book, uh, love the story, love the book, and then six months to a year later the film comes out, you go to the film and you wonder, there's, there's no connection. I, I, what happened to the book? Has that ever happened to you? Or where you go to see the film and, and your response is, oh, it's not nearly as good as the book. Why does that happen? <laughs> well, it does happen because fundamentally, <coughs> Screenwriting is a completely different kind of writing than 
regular writing, any kind of writing you can read. It's different than literature, it's different than poetry, it's different than writing a, a magazine article, a newspaper article, whatever. It's not the same. We use words. That's the only common part <laughs> we have. We use the same words. However, I, I would say when I answer this, because the stock answer for me is you need to think about who is the audience. In literature, when you write your book, fall out by the way, so, okay, when you write your book, you are the writer and you directly and completely prepare and write the book directly to the consumer, which means the reader. There is no th nothing in between. It's up to the reader to read what you wrote and then from there on, you know, like it, don't like it, imagine it. As a writer, you create scenes, you create uh, situations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those scenes and situations are actually filled in by the imagination of the reader. When you describe a character, the reader is going to imagine a mm -hmm. character based on your words, but they have their own imagination, right. okay? They see the character in a certain way. So there is, as it were, a sort of uh, uh, osmosis and kind of work between you and the reader. Mm -hmm. When we write a script, a script, uh, here is a question for many of you. How many of you read a script so far in your life? Yeah, My you. question would be why? <laughs> why did you write the, why did you read the script? Because I aspire to be a screenwriter. Thank you. But beyond <laughs> that, uh, my, my stop question to many of my t uh, students is, when was the last time you wanted to go to the Caribbean on vacation and said, I'm going to buy me a script and I'm going to read it on, this, on the beach? <laughs> Nobody does that. Why? Because screenwriting, the, the audience of a screenwriter is not the masses. The audience of a screenwriter is 50, 60, 70 people maximum. And those are the people who are going to make the movie. Hafed, let me interrupt you for just a second. Hafed has brought some screen plays in. I'm going to pass these around. One is for Slapshot, True Lies, movies that you've all heard of, The Descendants, uh, and Lethal Weapon. So I'll pass these around. Be careful with these. These are signed copies and Hafed would like them back. Uh -huh. But it'll give you an example of what, it, for those of you that have not looked at a script or screenplay, it'll give you very good examples of screenplays that, of course, became films. So, in a sense, uh, a screenwriter doesn't write for the public, as it were. A screenwriter writes for the producers, the directors, the investors, the, 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 the artists, the actors, the, the crew, as it were. I, you know, and crews can be as small as 10 people, 15 people. And I've been in crews where we had 300 people, 350 people. Raiders of the Lost Ark, we were 350 people every single day. And that did not include those who were working outside and were not on the set. So it's, it's a lot of people that can. So, but despite these big numbers, you still end up a screenplay, and this is why the, 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 it is so different. A screenplay is not a work that people will read on purpose just for the pleasure of reading. A screenplay is a blueprint for the movie. Uh, the best comparison I can have is the blueprint of a particular building in architecture. Who amongst us goes and says, hey, I would like to look at your blueprints. <laughs> you don't do that. You walk and you look at the building once it is there. And the same goes for screenwriting. So that's why there is that fundamental difference. Second fundamental difference is, for instance, for a writer when a, a writer has only the words to create this fascinating tapestry, this world of the story we call, and the writer is going to take as many words as they want to actually 
create that world in your mind. However, a screenwriter doesn't have to do that. A screenwriter has to have few lines to describe a place like this one. And he relies on the fact that beyond him and after him, there will be 20, 30 more people who are going to actually put in reality those few words to that, that helped him create the mood of the place. So if I were to describe the place, this place, I would say, well, in a screenplay, I cannot spend 20 pages to describe this place. All I can do is I say, well, it's a small, crammed uh, <laughs> kind of uh, <laughs> space where there is no way to even see uh, what's outside because Afed decided that he wants to, uh, to, to shade this thing, yeah. there, you know. Uh, so we, we, a screenwriter is the first step of a, an entire process. He is the first link. He is the person who actually put on the paper that story. But everyone, then comes the director, then comes the cinematographer, then comes the production designer, then comes all of these people. And all of those people are artists as well. And all they need is that one, two words that are in that screenplay. And that say, OK, uh, I see that room he's talking about. I'll recreate it. OK, mm -hmm. I'll make it happen. Uh, the best example uh, I, I always tell my student, uh, you know, if you have a hotel room, when you say, we are in a hotel room. Now, I am sure that every one of you has an idea when you say hotel room. You have an idea, what, is a, what does a hotel room look like? Okay. So I, as a screenwriter, I am not going to spend my time explaining exactly how that particular hotel room looks like. All I need is to create the idea, what, what, what's the general feeling about that? that hotel room. So, so and you so would say maybe it's a CD yeah. hotel room. It's, yeah, CD. You would say you just say. the word CD. Or I have seen in, I have wrote in my, one of my script. It's, I'm sure, sorry for those who, you know, I'm going to use a curse word kind of. Hotel room you have <laughs> ever been to. That's it. And that's the one sentence technically I, is the I, sentence. I've been in a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's just that, you know. And then come the other person, and the next person, and so on. And they are going to recreate it for you. So why do you have to spend the time to write exactly and what is on the right, and what is on the left? and what? So that, that economy, as it were, is part of, uh, of, of the, the craft itself. Last example, just to give you an idea. Uh, when you, uh, uh, when you uh, go from, let's say, a book. Generally, books today, and I don't think yours has that, but, but generally books are in the neighborhood of probably about 400 page, you know, sometimes, you know, 400, 500,000 words. If you took that same book <laughs> and you turned it around into a play, most likely you are going to end up with a play where there is only dialogue, right? Plays, it's a series of dialogue, you know? All you end up with is about maybe 80 to 100,000 words. If you go to a screenplay of the same exact book, we end up with about 30 to 40,000 words. That gives you an idea how different that screenwriting process is from in, in real terms. So a screenplay is 120 pages, but those are 120 pages of really the substance of every scene and every ex uh, uh, description and so on, because other people are going to come and they are going to make it happen. And you have to work with these other people. As a matter of fact, if you go on the tangent as a screenwriter and start to dwell on descriptions and directions and stuff like that, those readers are those readers, which means the director, the cinematographer, and so on, are going to be kind of what, as we say, pissed off. Because they say, wait a second, that's my job. You are interfering with my job. Don't tell me what I have to do. Okay? Just tell me what you want here. I'll make it happen. So that's one, of the, one of the interesting things that uh, I learned from Hafed is those scripts are 
it's almost an ironclad rule, 120 pages, because each page represents what? One, one minute. minute of film? One minute. So it's, yeah. it almost sounds like it's more engineering than it, it is. It is. It is actually. It is artistry it, and writing. Oh, oh it's, it's uh, w not only, uh, because he, here is the, the, the fundamental concept. Uh, generally, when you walk into a movie, most movies are in the neighborhood of about two hours today. There was a time when there was an hour and a half. Now, now more or less, it's about the two hours. Well, the two hours, so what a screenwriter writes is an entertainment piece that is supposed to cover the span of about two hours. Which means we have all to agree that what you wrote in that 120 pages, and 120 pages is because it is two hours, it's 120 minutes, that's about it. So 120 pages. Uh, uh, what you write on that one page has to actually become, down the road, one page. It cannot be more. This is amazing. One of my students shows up here. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, uh, so in, in a sense, what you, wrote, you have to be careful. Uh, I call screenwriting writing by length, meaning you have to be cognizant of how much description how much you put on one page so that we are all in agreement. When I write as a screenwriter that um, um, Johnny walks on the beach, the reader and me, myself as a screenwriter, we have to have exactly the same understanding of what does that mean Johnny walks on the beach. That one sentence cannot mean for me five seconds of, right of walking on the beach, and for you, it cannot mean 40 seconds. We have to have the same agreement. We have to understand that what I tell you, what I describe to you, is going to be exactly what's going to be on that screen. So it's all about the screen. Remember, it's screen writing, which means it is writing for the screen. It's all, Not, it's all visual. It's all yeah. visual. It has to be transferable to a screen. And so at this point, when I write a description on a page and I say, I take half a page, it means in practical terms for all of those who are making the movie that that description is going to take half a minute on the screen. Mm -hmm. So the screenwriter has to be cognizant of that fact. That's why the screenwriter writes, and then he goes back and says, oh my god, I have half a page there. Uh, then it means half a minute on the screen. Do I really want to have this guy watching the sea for half a minute? What does that mean? What is he going to do? There's nothing <laughs> happening there. So that's the connection between the images and the writing is essential in screenwriting. Let me uh, here, uh, you know, give you an example because I wanted. Is there any? One, where is it? Because I wanted to show you one or two examples here. Yeah, he was here. Uh. So here's Phil. Oh, Phil. Uh, this is an example, uh, uh, which, uh, which shows a little bit. This is from Chinatown. Uh, no, not Ch Chinatown. Uh, from uh, Robert Downey, who is the screenwriter of Chinatown and other movies. And uh, Robert uh, Towne uh, wrote or adapted a book that's called The Last Detail, wrote by, written by Daniel Ponixan. And, uh, and when he wrote that book, you know, there is the book and there is the movie. And there is what does a screenwriter do in order to adapt a book uh, uh, into a movie. So, why don't you, I, I, I just, I wanted to show you what he says about that particular scene he was talking about. Go ahead. But among other changes, the language is actually more realistic in the screenplay than in the book. I mean, the best illustration I can give you offhand in terms of language, uh, the scene where they go into the, the uh, bar to get a beer, and the guy refuses to serve them, and then he makes a remark about the black guy. Um, in the book, he says, I remember the one, he says, I have to give you a puck in the suit. 
to uh, the bartender. And he said, come on, you got to forget it, let's get out of here. Now, and they go. Now, in the movie, the same thing happens. And he says, if I hear one word from more word from you. Uh, now, I don't, I mean, I know that line was in there, because it's been eight, nine years. I know I, that was, I know that what happened afterwards was much more violent. And I, you know, I'm trying to, I'm, I don't mean to do violence to what was in Daryl's book, or uh, if I'm not recalling everything, and I feel better about that. But I know that what I wrote was, I said, I, I'm going to call the Sword Patrol. And he goes crazy like that. The guy really gets shook, and they pull him out of the bar. They have to physically pull him out of the bar, and then he gets outside and laughs off and starts going again. It was, it was, uh, you know, in terms of structure, it was trying to let everything simmer and be down until one explosive moment, which would forever change the tone of this journey of theirs from there to there. And in order to do that, it was necessary to create that moment. And also, I think it was more fun. You know, just uh, and more fun for Jack. You know, and I knew Jack to do it. Is, uh, is knowing Jack, and I really wrote it for Jack. Knowing Jack has that kind of explosiveness. So, in a sense, here uh, uh, you, you, you get a good example of the fact that that even if it is written in a certain way in a book, when you adapt that into screenplays, into movies, because screenplays are nothing else but how the movie is going to look like down the road. So, to answer, for instance, an earlier question about why do are people surprised down the road that hey I didn't see that scene in the book or mm -hmm. I didn't I, d I didn't imagine that scene like that in the book well this is what happens because scenes are more visual and we need sometimes in adapting a book to take 20 pages and to no that's not <laughs> true of it uh, and we need to, to, to get these scenes in, in a totally different order or to create scenes that never existed. But those scenes are replacing 20 pages of description in a book that I cannot show in a movie because they are all not visual. In a book, I can entertain with the reader uh, any kind of thoughts, but thoughts <coughs> cannot be seen. You have to make them into a scene so that I can see them. So you have to transform those 20 pages in a scene that has some punch, that has some ideas. That so in this case, he had to take this entire scene and concentrate it in that short exchange between Jack Nicholson and the redneck in question and make that explosiveness be part of the character. Well, I, I suppose, too, it depends if Jack Nicholson had not been cast in that film, would that make a difference? It would make an entire so, difference. So depending on who the actor or actress is, yeah, that yeah. may change the script? I, I can you, can you, uh, there's a great story mm. Hafed has mm. about improvising and changing scripts. Can you tell us about Indiana Jones and Harrison oh, Ford? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it is sometimes because uh, 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 movies are made not always based 100% on what is written on a script. As a matter of fact, in our business, it is customary known that you end up uh, the minimum drafts that are absolutely required. That is once you have gone uh, through your own drafts as screenwriter. Uh, uh, I was just watching an interview with Guillermo Ariaga, who is the screenwriter of Babel and uh, 28 Grams and movies like that, Fasten, Amores, Peros, and so on. And he was saying that uh, he himself goes through about 35 drafts. Wow. 35 times you write the script and so on. I'm writing a script right now, and, and I've gone about nine of them already. I'm already nauseated, but I know that I'm <laughs> far away from getting wherever I want to get. So uh, uh, it is customarily, not, and, and all of that doesn't count when comes the day that you are presenting finally your script to a studio or to a producer for acquisition, that script is considered as to be draft one. <laughs> this is the first draft. You know, nothing you did before counts. And from there on, 
we expect a minimum of seven to eight drafts that are going to happen. One of them is the producer, one of them is the directors, one of them is, and one of them is, for instance, when finally you have the star who is going to play in that movie. And every star is different. Uh, I was yesterday sitting with uh, a friend of mine who is a producer, and uh, he was telling me about he's trying to get a movie done and so on, and, and, and I happen to be part of that script as well. And the discussion at this point is going on between him and different actresses that are supposed to be the main actresses in the movie. So you talk to Tilda Swinson, for instance, you have to wait for about three months until she has the time to read your script and finally tell you whether or not she likes it or not. In the meantime, you cannot contact any other actress because no actress is going to read a script if she knows that the script is read by someone else. So you have to wait for four months until she finally says no or yay. And if now she says no, then we have to move to uh, uh, Angelina Jolie, okay? Uh, which probably is going to say no, because Brad Pitt doesn't want it. But that's whatever. <laughs> so all, all I am saying is you have to rewrite the script for whoever is that next person who is going to, that person who is going to end up. Because they have a way, they have tics, they have uh, idiosyncrasies, they have Jack Nicholson can do scenes like this. You give this scene to, uh, I don't know, to, uh, uh, to someone else, he's going to completely kill it. Yeah. He's not going to be able to make it. So th that's kind of where we we'll Talk about on. the improvising that uh, Harrison yeah. Ford did. So to go back to, imp uh, so, so one of the drafts that happen in a movie is when you are on the set, which means now you have had a script, you have the actors, you have everyone, you have everybody on the set. Well, guess what? There is a draft that actually takes place right there. And that's why you need sometimes to have the screenwriter on the set, because there will be changes. And one of the most uh, fascinating changes I have seen in my life, I was working when I finished school. I, my first gig was to be uh, assistant number, one, number 272, probably, <laughs> uh, at uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. My job was, we were uh, in, in Tunisia shooting the movie, and the, the place where we were shooting was called Kerouan. And it was 45 miles away from the beach, where uh, we had our headquarters, technically, where all the crew was on the beach in a nice hotel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, um, I was the designated driver. They gave me this fascinating Jaguar, which I never drove in my life. But you know, and I was driving uh, Steven Spielberg to the sh to the shoot and from the shoot. Uh, I can tell you right away, Steven Spielberg doesn't talk. So you know, uh, there was no discussion during the traveling time. Okay, so uh, uh, the one day. Harrison Ford finally made it to the, to, the, to the shoot. So he arrives, and Harrison Ford is, um, is exactly the opposite of, uh, of uh, uh, Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg doesn't talk to anyone, doesn't mingle, doesn't, uh, doesn't drink, doesn't go to bars, doesn't do anything. He sits in his own room. He watches old movies. That was part of my job as well. I had to bring him every day a new old movie that he watches in his suit. In his suit, uh, in his suite, kind of. So anyway, uh, uh, my part of my role became, you know, when Harrison Ford came in, so I had to drive them both. Well, he doesn't talk, but at least Harrison Ford is a very affable person, so we were talking together. Anyway, so he was telling me as we were driving, and I say, uh, that was the first day, you know, and, and, and he's like, hey, can you stop somewhere? I really have, you know, 
I didn't know what, you know, so find, find a bathroom, so find a bathroom. Okay, fine. You know, and then, you know, 10 miles more, I said, could you find a bathroom? And I said, well, like, <laughs> what the hell is going on? You know, so, and, and he says, hey, Hafed, it's, it's just like, I must have eaten some stuff yesterday night when I came the first time. And he's a good eater as well. So he had some bad kind of reaction, bug or, or you know, bug or something. <laughs> So we arrive at finally in the place to the set where there was this famous scene, if you all remember, when uh, Harrison Ford was fighting with this uh, crazy guy who has the, the whip. The whip. Yeah. And, and, and uh, they were, and, and the way how, uh, how uh, uh, Steven Spielberg, Spielberg works is he, he really doesn't want to make choices on the set, so he would have five, six cameras filming the same scene, and each one of those cameras will follow a particular person, and the job is really done in the editing suite. That's how he works, which is very expensive, but he can afford it. So uh, he had all of these cameras, and he was kind of, and, and now we were rehearsing with uh, Harrison Ford and with this guy and so on, and Harrison Ford was really miserable. He wanted to go to the bathroom. That's all he wanted to do. So, and for every two minutes, he said, can I stop? I need to go to the bathroom. And I'm like, my God, I mean, I have to find a bathroom for every time. So, so you know, poor porta potty and all of that stuff, you know. So he was tired. And we were rehearsing and rehearsing. And the scene is rehearsed, you know, for two, three, four hours and so on. And the scene as written in the screenplay was, uh, Harrison Ford was able to, at the end, take that whip from the guy and basically overwhelm him and to hit him or something of the sort. That was kind of the scene. Well, Harrison Ford was very weak. He couldn't do that. <laughs> he was tired. At some point, he turns to uh, Spielberg and he says, well, uh, Steven, I have an idea. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Spielberg, being the smart guy he is, he said, well, what do you have? He said, um, what about, you know, if this guy does all his magic and stuff like that, and I would let him do his magic, and at some point, you know, just take my pistol and shoot him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason he did that, he was tired, for God's sake. <laughs> he didn't want to go through the process of the whole scene. However, it ended up being one of the most, the most fascinating scenes. So this is what I call technically the scene where, where on the set, you are actually writing yet another draft of the screenplay. That was not on the page. Okay. So uh, um, you all have seen, I'm sure, the movie uh, um, Midnight Cowboy. Uh, Midnight Cowboy is a fascinating movie, as you all know. And uh, uh, is that what you have right now? What we have? No. I can't access the menu on this one. I'm sorry. This is not. We, we need to take that out. This is not the one I want. Okay. Okay. It's it's the we'll next one. That yeah. Any better? No. This. Uh, yeah, that's, that is the timing you have it there. Anyway, I, I hope we'll get to that scene. And then we, we want to keep this uh, for time for questions. So. Yes, I'm, so, I'm sure. So, uh, well, let's, um, while Phil is doing that, yeah. th let's interrupt for just a minute. Do any of you have questions for Hafed while we're waiting? <laughs> Pam. Yeah. Dad, there was a script floating around and it said, screenplay on Yeah, oh God. The, the, the oh God. Excuse me, just a minute. The question is, on a script, there might be an attribution for different writers, different names. What, why is that? Well, uh, obviously, the, the, the profession of writing is very well codified in, through the WGA, which is called the Writers Guild of America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So everybody has a part particularly people have this impression that because they can put pages, they can write something, it means that they can have a say. And some of them do and some of them don't. What happens is 
when you are, you can be writing as a screenwriter, you can be writing an original screenplay. It's your idea, nobody gave you anything, nobody helped you with that, and you are writing the script on your own, and it's it, absolutely nobody helped you with that. Then you will get what we call the credit, screenplay by, or written by, and then you can put your name. That's kind of the best scenario in the world. However, that best scenario in the world almost never happens because down the road, a studio is bound to change that script. No matter how, as I told you, they go and they, you know, they read your script, we love it. And we are gonna pay you a million dollars for that script, okay? That, that they love it. Um, however, we are gonna make a few changes. I said, you just paid me a million dollars, and you said it's great. Why do you want to make changes? Well, just to make it happen, you know. We have this actor, we have, so you have to, go through changes. It is called development. And development is known more known in our business as development hell. Okay? <laughs> because uh, uh, the studio will never tell you that directly, but they are going to read your script and they're gonna say, you know, it, it's, it's great script. But we are gonna get someone, I mean, Hafed or Jim or whoever, he's good at imagining the story and so on, but we would like to perk up the dialogue. So what they do is they bring another screenwriter who happens to be very good with dialogue. He's going to take your script and he's going to change the dialogue a little bit here and there. And, you know, then that screenwriter suddenly now has some paternity, as it were, and some, uh, you know, say, well, I was participant in the script. Okay, fine. Sometimes the studio likes your story, likes your script in general, but they feel that it lacks some sort of work on this, <laughs> on structure, on character, on whatever. The concept is great. And by the way, they don't like you too. You know, you are not <laughs> kind of, you know, the kind of guy they want to go with out, you know. Uh, Charlie Kaufman, if you all know Charlie Kaufman, who is the writer of, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, um, uh, for instance, the spotless mind, you know, the, uh, and movies like that. Uh, uh, he is not a very sociable person. This is a guy who doesn't want to be in bars, who doesn't want to sit, who doesn't want to go to parties, who doesn't want to be, you know, he's not the social animal, as it were. Well, they don't like to work with him because he's <laughs> not the, guy, the kind of guy, the funny guy. So what do they do? They will get someone else, one or two people who are going to take your script and they are going to rewrite it. And if they rewrite it, now they have right to that screenplay. So suddenly, if the studio buys the script or says, we like the script written, rewritten by these two, then you, the owner of the original script, suddenly you have no right anymore in the title screenplay by. Your title become story by. Oh. And they will say screenplay by the two new people who wrote the script. Mm. Now, now, if this goes one time, that's fine. But if this goes two times, three oh. times, four times, five times, you end up in cases, in nut cases, like for instance, uh, anybody remembers the movie My uh, stepmother is an alien, yeah. <laughs> which is a stupid script and stupid <laughs> movie anyway. But my stepmother an, uh, is an, was an or is an alien. I don't know. Uh, was written literally by twenty six screenwriters. Wow. Twenty six screenwriters. When the movie finally was what we call green lit, which means the studio said yes, okay, we are going to film it now as it is right now. The WGA had to come and to basically make a determination because they cannot have screenplay by 26, 26 people. Yeah. I mean, do you imagine yourself reading 26 names? Who? No, the Screenwriters Guild has to sit down, review all those drafts, and determine who are the maximum six people that actually had the most influence creatively on that screenplay. 
So that's why you end up sometimes with very fantasy kind of uh, <laughs> de denomination and number. Plus, you end up with people like, for instance, the director most of the time, because he made some changes. He said, well, I am allowed to have the uh, credit as co-screenwriter. Uh, uh, you have people who were, uh, you have a producer who um, happened to have uh, his girlfriend loves writing. And he's like, <laughs> hey, I will put money in the movie if my girlfriend will work with you on the script. <laughs> and things of that sort. So there is a lot of nepotism going on there. And so that sometimes you are going to end up with a someone being the, for instance, we have this title, just for your information, the title of associate producer, it's a hodgepodge of anything you can put. That mm. goes from the guy who put the money and who says, hey, if I put there $10 million, would you give me a title? And say, yeah, associate producer, <laughs> you know, and uh, plus the title that uh, uh, disgruntled, um, producer who happens to be in love with a new wife, he will give her that title. What the heck, to just <laughs> have her happy, you know? So it's kind of the hodgepodge title where you throw everybody. So that's kind of other the answer. Question. Other questions? Bill. Um, is there a similarity between screenwriting and playwriting? The, the, excuse me. The question is, is there a similarity between screenwriting and playwriting? Well, the similarity probably ends in one, one part. Uh, we use the same word. That's exactly the only similarity. However, the worlds are so different that you, than you cannot imagine. L let me give you the basic fundamental uh, difference. Number one, in theater, you are stuck with you know, a space, a stage. You don't have that ability to jump somewhere uh, in cinema, the fascinating part about movies is you have your actor, he opens the door, and he's in uh, Minnesota, you know, the next day, he's, uh, the next thing, he's in California. You know, that magic, theater doesn't have. It cannot offer mm -hmm. you that, that instantaneous magic, okay? Uh, theater cannot offer you the ability to see what's in the mind of a character. But in movies, we can do that very easily, you know, just show the guy thinking and then I can show you what he's thinking and what he's... So all of those are the clear differences. In practical terms, okay, uh, there is a fundamental difference that is really, uh, that creates a lot of frictions. Uh, a playwright, when he writes his, his, his play, uh, and when it is printed and definitely in the public, it becomes ironclad. Nobody can touch mm. one single word of that play unless the writer agrees. And that's why writers, when uh, in Broadway or wherever, when there is a rehearsal for a play, the writer is there. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it is short in time. It's about usually two, three months rehearsal. And that writer is there just in case, somehow, uh, there is a need to change a particular sentence or a particular mm -hmm. dialogue so that it's better said or whatever it is. So only the writer has to do that, has the right to do that. In cinema, it's different. In cinema, if a producer tells you, I'm going to buy your script, and here is a check, and you sign on the dotted line, you have given up all all your rights automatically. You have absolutely no say whatsoever in any change that can be done by anyone that is approved by the producer or whoever. Anybody can make a change. And that's kind of why I would say a lot of, not a lot, 99% of the screenwriters are unhappy people because they have no control, <laughs> honestly, probably beside me, <laughs> they have no control over what happens to their movies. Stories, horror stories about screenwriters who were ostracized from the process once they sold their script uh, are bound. You know, there are millions of stories like that. And you have no recourse. 
you why because unfortunately filmmaking is the most expensive art after architecture no other art is as expensive as filmmaking point, yeah. and so the producer basically have this approach and they say I have to have the ability when I buy a script I own it I have to have the ability to change it so that I can make a better move so that I can make because a writer what does a writer know a writer is sitting there for four, five, six months, a year, four, four years, writing a script. He has no connection with the business world. He doesn't know what works and what doesn't work. So if we decide as producers that there is this uh, love scene there and we want to show a little bit more flesh there, while in the script it was a 30 second scene and I want to make it a one minute scene, I do it because I want to make more money. And I know why I'm doing it. I have to have the right to do that. So that's a fundamental difference where a screenwriter has no control over his or her words as soon as you have sold your script. You have one choice. If at the end of the day you have never been part of that process, of the production process, and you are invited one day to watch your own movie, in the theater and you enter and you watch that movie and you are like what the heck <laughs> is this I have never written any of that this is not my screenplay the only thing you can do is you and you have that right obviously to say I don't want you to put my name there that's all you can do we are at an hour and for those of you that need to leave uh, please feel free to do so uh, this is fascinating to me. So if some of you would like to continue with questions, we can do that. But if you need to run, uh, feel free to do that. Okay, fine. Uh, another question, Rhonda? going through, shuffling through something or searching a room, it's going to take more than a minute. And that's just a line. So well. that's, I got 72 pages, you know. Well. Oh, well. So, excuse me, just a, yeah. so the, the question is, uh, if I've only written a 72 page screenplay, can that still last two hours? It is, did. It, it did, did last two hours. Yeah. yeah. And How I, do you answer I that? I could never <laughs> sell that. I had to do the same as Exactly. Uh, uh, first of all, if you sent me, just me, the screenplay of 72 pages and you would say this is a feature film, I wouldn't even read it. That, because it means one thing to me. Uh, you are not, you didn't write it properly. It was written in a way that was not what screenwriters, this is not the way how screenwriters write. And to me, if I was a producer, it's an indication that the person who wrote this has no idea about screenwriting and about filmmaking in general. And so for me, it is very simple. I'll throw it in the side. Uh, uh, why? Because I get every day 10, 15 scripts that are unsolicited and people want me to read. Why would I spend my time in something that I know for a fact is not ready? So what is there, what is the, the issue there? The issue there is you wrote it according to your knowledge of the regular writing. For you, you'd say, yes, uh, he is uh, looking into his papers in his, uh, uh, in his desk. Okay, fine. But in your mind, what you had was, it's going to take some time on screen to actually do that action. No, for us, I have to have an idea, a clear idea, how long it's going to take. Which means, if you wanted to tell me that it is going to take 30 seconds, you would have to describe 30, half a page of description of actions, looking, he opens a, 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 a drawer, he looks into the, uh, there is a stack of pages here, he looks under them, he turns around. Why do we write that? Those are the actions that are going to make that half a page. 
Now you have half a page instead of that one line. That one line in your mind as a regular, what I call regular mortal, is uh, 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 meant it's going to take half a minute, 45 seconds. To me, as a screenwriter, I read that one line, I said, oh, it's two seconds. Mm. That's the difference. So if you have in mind an action that is going to last one minute, you are going to have to fill a page. There is no other way around it. That's the convention that's the, uh, between me as a writer and the people who are going to read my screenplay, who are the filmmakers who are going to make it into a movie. I would completely mess them up if I tell them, hey, uh, he's looking for this letter on around his desk. And in my mind, I thought it's going to take half a minute. But when I write it for them, it meant two seconds. And that's the fundamental point. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, is there a different set of rules then for the independent filmmakers and screenwriters? Because what I think you're describing is the industry, the film machine. You become a screenwriter, you join the guild, there's the same for actors and so on. And this is how it's done. But as an independent screenwriter, filmmaker, are the rules different? Or are they really closer than you think? The, the question is, are the rules different for a screenwriter working in independent films versus a screenwriter trying to sell to the industry? The answer is absolutely none. They are absolutely the same rules. It's not about where your movie or by whom your movie is going to be produced. It's about the understanding, it's about what I understand and you understand as a reader. If I send you my script and you are a producer, you have to understand exactly what I have in mind. Okay? Uh, going back to literature in general, uh, in literature, as I said, you take 20 pages to describe to me the feeling of um, character in uh, watching the sunset. OK? You can take 20 pages, OK? How long does it really take in a movie to do that? Probably, what, five seconds? After five seconds, if I showed you more than that, you're going to be bored as a viewer. And you are going to say, well, OK, what's happening? So he's watching the sunset. Great. It's a great sunset. Mm, OK, let's move on. So what now? That's the fundamental part. So it is not about who is going to make the movie, whether it is the big studio, or whether it is a small independent movie maker, or at the end of the day, whether it is yourself as an independent producer, you decided to make the movie on your own. It doesn't matter. That has to be written in that particular format, and we actually have software that can help you with that format. But you have to know how to use it, and you have to know how to exactly what to put on a page so that what I see on screen is exactly equivalent to what you put on the page. That's why I said screenwriting is writing by length. So if I put there a certain amount of time, I am not writing. Uh, let me put the difference between, uh, again, between writing, regular writing, and, and, and screenwriting. When you are writing a book, your page is a page of a book. You have whatever, you know, that page is filled with dialogue, thoughts, everything. When I write a screenplay, I'm not writing a page of a screenplay. I am, my page is a screen. I put images on that screen. I'm not writing sentences. They happen to be sentences. But they are visual sentences that translate exact actions. When I say Johnny enters the kitchen, slams the door, that's a very visual action that you can see in your mind's eye. You can see very clearly. OK? So that's the I cannot go. As he enters, he thinks about the horrible day he has and the fight he has with his boss and stuff like that. I cannot see that. 
And if I cannot see it, it cannot be on the page. So those rules, when you put them together, and you put this, a certain formatting principles that we have as well, all of them concoct that to be, at the end of the day, a format that expresses the same exact thing to you as a reader and to me as a writer. I do not want to be in a situation when I am ex ex exactly your situation. John is looking at the letter around the, whatever, the desk, and in my mind, I was thinking it's going to be half a second, half a minute, or, or a minute, and yet in your mind, you read it and you thought it was. That would be terrible, because that would be money that you throw on the air. Question, sir? I'm going to change the subject. Uh, I've had an observation, you can tell me whether it's accurate or not. The British seem to be the most wonderful cinematographers uh, compared to the rest of the world. And is my perception right or wrong? And if so, why? The, the question is, uh, we've got someone from England here. You can tell my accent. And the question is, are the British better filmmakers than anyone else? And, and if they are, why? Well, uh, let me understand. Is it filmmaker or cinematographer? Cinematographer, which is, which is a slightly... The camera angles, the way they approach their filmmaking, or their, maybe their photography is a better way to say yeah. it. Well, you, you know, I... Uh, um, it, it's... Uh, it's, it's um, it may be a valid observation. I think what is happening is uh, British filmmakers have this ability to, uh, contrary to our system in the United States, where we are very practical and very cognizant of the process and the price of the process and how things work and, and how much money and all of that stuff, in Europe in general, and I would say it is not necessarily only England, I think the French movies, the German movies, and so on are in the same boat. Um, movies are considered to be an art form before being a commercial endeavor. Mm -hmm. In the United States, movies are a business, first and foremost. Movies are made to make money. They are not necessarily works of art, or at least to this day we do not still consider. The, the closest we come to that is when a producer, a Hollywood producer will say, well, it's a business and it's an art. In Europe, it's an art. It's not a business. It's part of the culture. It's part of the expression. of, And as such, most of the time is spent to express that feeling, the fact that we are dealing with a work of art. And that work of art is out there to last, to express a part of the psyche of that whole society. And so I tend to believe that they spend more time finessing and working with the details of what is mm -hmm. While in the United States, we, we spend a lot more time to have the explosions and the special effects. <laughs> you know, so that's kind of uh, my take on okay. this. Was there next to him, was there, ma'am? Uh, Minnesota, the state of Minnesota was a hotbed of film activity, filmmaking in the 1990s. If you're talking about cinematography, you're talking about the situation in the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, it's not like the situation Yeah, the question <laughs> is, Minnesota in the 1990s was very active with filmmaking. Uh, what's the situation today in Minnesota? Well, um, um, not very, very good, I would say. Um, uh, you know, in the 90s, we have had, in this state, we were able, and when I say we were able, it's kind of the community of filmmakers, and I'm part of it. Uh, we were able to convince the legislature to promote and to help promote making movies in Minnesota. Incentives were or existed, and those incentives made it possible to many companies in Hollywood to say, wow, if we go to Minnesota, we are going to pay sales taxes, or we are going to get uh, you know, more incentives in hotels, or what have you. 
uh, the one country that completely beat uh, every single place in the United States was Canada. Canada was offering so many incentives in the 90s and up until to the 2000 and so on, and, and not now anymore. But they were offering so many incentives that basically everybody thought twice about filming anything in the United States. Most of the most renowned movies you know of were shot in Vancouver or in Toronto. And why? Because obviously the dollar, there was a huge difference. So you have a movie that costs $10 million here, you go to Canada, it costs you seven, okay, to make the same move. So that's kind of a lot of money. <laughs> and then e there was many other incentives like, you know, uh, traveling, hotels, plane, t tickets, whatever. So, so when you add all of that up together, it's very hard to fight Canada. At the level of United States, what happened that was every single state, or more or less most of them, try to create an incentive to bring filmmakers, Hollywood filmmakers, to, United, to, to their own s state. Minnesota was one of them. Uh, this, what was known as, and I still it is known right now, as a snow bait which is a rebate <laughs> that you get when you come to uh, film in, in Minnesota. And that's why at that time when that snow bait was in existence, uh, there was a whole slew of productions, Jingle All the Way and uh, the Grumpy Old Man and all of those people who came in here, uh, they didn't come simply because they loved Minnesota, they came because it was mm, good to make, it was a good financial decision. Uh, uh, well, I'm not going to get into the detail, but you know that we do not have that snow bait anymore, which came back. Now it is coming back slowly, and we are fighting again with the uh, legislature so that we can really, really put it in the books. Now we have something else, which is called the, the legacy amendment mm -hmm. and so on, that can help uh, in that sense. So, uh, in general, uh, um, states are competing to get those uh, crews to come to their own state. Florida is very strong on that. Carolinas are very strong on that. Arizona is very strong on that. Wisconsin is very strong on that. Guess what? Until they got that last governor. Sorry. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, no, but it is, it's a fact. You know, you cut things and suddenly they, there is not. And there are movies that were supposed to come here to Minnesota ended up in Wisconsin, simply because they beat us in terms of that, that, uh, that, that incentive. incentive. And yeah. that's how you promote things in general. And that's why the situation at this point mm -hmm. is not yet in the best. But we are hoping that maybe with the new legislature we will have more uh, incentive. There is some incentives on the book at this point. But uh, as, as it is right now, they are not that different than from other states. So it's difficult for producers in Hollywood to suddenly say, oh, we are going to go to Minnesota. Let's take one more question. Yeah. Papa, can you tell us all the classes in creation? Oh, God. Because you're head of the screenwriting. Yes, I am the head of the screenwriting. The, the question is, you know. what classes do you teach? I, I teach mostly screenwriting, obviously. But I, since my formative years, I am a producer, director, screenwriter. So I can teach any of those classes. And I did teach most of these classes. And I run the program of screenwriting. And uh, obviously, in our uh, department, uh, students come. Once they are accepted into the program, they come into this pool of one year where they learn uh, the basics, uh, which is production, screenwriting, camera, everything. And from there on, they choose their own specialty. And some of them will come to screenwriting. Some of them will go to directing, producing, cinematography, editing, etc., etc. And at the end, those people get together, and they will make movies together. But they all start, obviously, those movies have to start with the student screenwriters who write the stories for the producers and directors. And those stories are then produced by, by the different students. At yes, it is at MCTC where we have, MCTC happens to have the, the basically the only real production program. There are a lot of cinema programs, you hear that in many, many, uh, 
many colleges and universities. The reality of it is many colleges and universities have what we call uh, b uh, uh, studies, cinema studies. They are mostly mm -hmm. uh, not really production program comparable to our program. Our program is the only program in the state and in the five states around, actually. I was visiting a friend in Carleton uh, when it was in a film class. The teacher basically turned on the movie and then left the room. Yeah, <laughs> that, 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 yeah that's exactly the way how it works. Yeah. I think we're going to have to wrap this up. I think Hafed would be happy to stick around. Uh, his books or textbooks are for sale. And I think he'd be happy to, if you have other questions, perhaps oh, if you sure. have a script, he can tell you how difficult it is to get it sold. But anyway, thank you, Hafed, for being here. Thank you.